The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. <coughs> well, welcome to the second in the our series of AIML talks. Uh, these are co-sponsored by George Mason University and Metro. And as well as the talk today on deep learning, a Bayesian perspective, we also have scheduled four additional talks. And I'll just give you the, the quick times and titles. I'll send these out to you in, in notice so you can plan ahead. But uh, July, there'll be a big gap here, but July 30th, uh, we have a talk by Alexander Band at the University of California, Berkeley, on both global vehicle control at large and local scale, the mixed autonomy traffic, cold optimization, and deep uh, reinforcement, reinforcement learning approaches. On August 6th, we have probably a very controversial talk by Dimitris Bertsimus, the MIT Sloan School. This is an optimal classification of trees and interpretable AI. So we can interpret, explain, interpretable and explainable AI at the video. August 13th, Nicholas Polson, University of Chicago, sparse Bayesian regression for high dimensional regression and classification. And September 18th, Yana Koseka from George Mason University, AI for Detection and Identification. So today, uh, I'm going to give you a little background on Guy Dean here, who is a professor at the Systems Engineering Operations Research Department at George Mason. Uh, he works on building robust solutions for large-scale complex systems, systems analysis at the interface, interface of simulation-based modeling and statistics. This involves developing new methodologies that rely on deep learning, Bayesian analysis, and design of computational experiments. So inspired by an interest in urban systems, he co-developed a mobility simulator called Polaris that is currently used for large-scale transportation networks analysis by both local and federal governments. Prior to joining GMU, he was a principal computational scientist at Argonne National Laboratory a fellow at the Computational Computation Institute at the University of Chicago, and a lecturer at the Master of Science Analytics Program at the University of Chicago. Professor Sokol. Thank you very much, Larry, for organizing and inviting. And I had a chance to meet several people from Metron. It looks like you guys are doing quite amazing stuff here, and uh, hopefully something will grow out of the seminar series and you know collaboration between you and, and academia. Uh, Bayesian perspective from deep learning, just to, to give you highlights. I don't think I have any good answers for you in terms of how to bring Bayesian and deep learning. I don't think there are good ways so far to do it. And uh, we just talked about those big companies paying a lot of attention to deep learning. And it doesn't seem like they pay too much attention to Bayesian aspects of, of deep learning. If you see a lot of the papers come, they don't have much of Bayesian flavors to it. And people who the Bayesian inside of Google's and Facebook's, uh, you can you basically you know can count them using one hand. Uh, so there's not there's not that much happening in, in this area. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. It's an exciting area. So if you in this Bayesian deep learning uh, interface, uh, I think there's still I mean, I mean, field is very competitive because it's, it's very competitive field to try to come up with something new. But this interface between Bayesian and deep learning, I think, has a lot of potential uh, for development. Uh, the work I'm going to present, uh, a lot of it is uh, published in Bayesian Analysis Journal. It's a 2017 paper. It has the same title as the title of the presentation. It's a uh, it's a survey paper that was written for statisticians. Uh, we try to explain what deep learning is and how deep learning can be interpreted from Bayesian perspective and from statistical perspective, and try to connect, you know, deep learning to non-parametric modeling, for example. So it's, it was our attempt to explain to statistics community what deep learning is, and uh, there is there is not much I think happening in statistics. Also, I think statisticians are still picking up on deep learning. If you go to I go to stats conferences a lot, and you barely see any deep learning talks in stats conferences for some reason. But I think this thing will slowly be changing. It just takes a while for the stats community to, to adapt. And this is another paper that has some of the beats of the talk. Uh, it's actually is to be published soon. This is basically spatial temporal modeling and how we can use deep learning and spatial temporal modeling. Uh, spatial temporal modeling is uh, 
uh, classical uh, application and statistics, um, and we show that deep learning methods can outperform more traditional statistical tools uh, for, uh, and we showed for high frequency trading and, and traffic flows, we showed for two applications. That's how we started working on deep learning. Uh, we started, uh, my, my applications went transportation, I worked with Argon, and a lot of the work was around transportation. And it seems like it's second transportation talk, and you're going to have Alex Banz going to be talking. So you'll see some transportation applications here, but nothing wrong. It's you know it's a fruitful area. Um, so and one of the quintessential transportation problems is to predict traffic flows. Okay, and traffic flows uh, can be predicted using the observations. So we have observed data. The red dots are the sensor locations. We collect vehicle speeds, volumes. Uh, basically counts how many vehicles go through this location. Uh, we have uh, 1,500 of them in the Chicago metropolitan area, so we collect this data, and we want to predict the speed in the next 45 minutes, given the current speed and the speed observed for the last 24 hours. Uh, we were particularly interested in predicting non-recurrent events. It's somewhat of an easy problem to predict uh, recurrent events. So you know that 66 is going to get congested at this specific time, at this specific location. It happens pretty much every day. Uh, can we say something about non recurrent So this is an example of the various games. So the red line is your average speed at this specific location of I-55. That's the highway that goes from south uh, suburbs uh, to the downtown Chicago, where the various play day games. <clears throat> and uh, so the red is the averages. This is your normal day. And the blue line is the day when Chicago Bears were playing. And you can see that there's deviation between 3 and uh, 8. The game starts at 7, I believe. So traffic starts at around 3 p.m. So there's a huge deviation. And our goal was to try to predict those things. So rather than predict normal traffic patterns, we want to predict those solid lines. I'm not going to go through methodology. And I, I mean, OK, so there's another example. There's a whole bunch of non recurring events, right? So sports game is one of them. Weather event is another one. This is January 21st, 2016. Uh, this is Washington, D.C., and the snapshot was taken at 12.41 a.m. So this is almost, you know, it's 40 minutes after midnight. On a normal day, you won't see any traffic in this area. Uh, but you see a complete gridlock at 1 a.m., okay? And uh, the reason for this complete gridlock is snow, and we're talking about half an inch of snow, as far as I remember. So it's a very minor, weather event, you know, compared to big hurricanes, for example, it's a very minor event that can disrupt the whole system and put it uh, put complete gridlock. Um, so relationship, the spatial temporal relationship and traffic are very nonlinear. Uh, this is example of the speeds, and this is in meters per second, so 25 meters per second. To get to miles per hour, you need to roughly double it. So it's roughly 50 miles per hour. Uh, so this is the sensor 6040, uh, and uh, this is sensor uh, also 6040 with some time delay. So basically what you see is uh, uh, at time t and the time t plus 10, and uh, at t is uh, time step is 5 minutes. So we're talking about uh, each observation is here 15 minutes apart from each other. So you see it's very nonlinear, so if you try to use any type of ARIMA model that assumes linear relationship between t and t plus h, this model does somewhat okay, but uh, but uh, very inaccurate. And traditional approach was using the Rima models in transportation. People tried, and it was a workhorse uh, for traffic flow predictions. So we tried deep learning. Um, not sure if you can see very well. Uh, so the black line here is the actual data, and the red line is the prediction by a deep learning model. And this is a prediction, so the, the, this is a noisy prediction, so we actually can ignore the bottom row, we can just focus on the top row. So the red line is the prediction that comes out of the deep learning model. An important part of it is that, so here where surprise is happening, so you remember on a normal day we didn't see this congestion here at around 3 p.m., but the model does capture this degradation, it does predict that uh, there is going to be a down rate in the traffic flows, and then when recovery starts, it's also quite accurately captures. It's actually anticipated a little bit early, so the recovery will start a little bit early, see this bump here, but then it captured this recovery and, and predicted it. So I do not uh, show you a RIMA prediction, but the RIMA prediction is going to be way off in this situation. Okay? So a deep learning model was able to capture the special relationship, special temporal relationship in the traffic, um, and was able, so this is weather day, uh, this is snow, 
and this is normal day. And normal day is actually almost perfect fit, just because in normal day there's a lot of patterns in the data, and deep learning picks up those patterns quite well. And normal day is, is, is actually quite an easy task with deep learning. Okay. Um, so uh, why do we care about deep learning? This is mostly for people who have not uh, worked with deep learning models, who are you know still in the in the phase where trying to figure out what it is. So I have a quick uh, overview. Uh, deep learning is a, it's a pattern matching algorithm that works very well in high dimensional spaces. Most of the successful stories of deep learning that we see nowadays is in uh, natural language processing and in image processing, and those are high dimensional uh, inputs. So if you think of uh, one megapixel image, it has one million inputs. Okay? So if you think of traditional statistical model trying to work on uh, one million dimensions, uh, you probably won't be able to build a traditional statistical model in these dimensions, so anti clinic works. You know, it does, it, does, it does quite well, has a lot of successes. So you had a talk in April uh, from, uh, from Uber, and uh, there was a lot of publications where images from cameras from cars were analyzed using deep learning. So I have an example of the Waymo, which is a competitor. So Waymo claims they process <laughs> 6 megabytes of data per second that comes from the sensors. And most of the processing comes uh, through deep learning. Okay, so if you're training in more traditional statistics, you can think of deep learning as a factor model, but it's a multi layer factor model. So, factor is a combination of the inputs. Okay? So, in this case, this is a very silly example. You have uh, inputs which are attributes of the house, and you want to predict the price of the house. And rather than building predictive model using the original set of inputs, you build predictive model using the set of factors, which is just combinations of the original inputs. And that's exactly what deep learning does. It does bind those um, in, in machine learning, they call them features or representations. So you take original data set and find features or representations, and you do it multiple times. You do it layer after layer after layer before you get something where, you know, a linear model, for example, a generalized linear model can find a pattern. And at the last layer, you would have linear generalized linear model. So uh, why deep learning works? It works just because it can. Uh, it has much more flexible way of uh, uh, splitting the input space into subspaces and find pattern in those subspaces. Uh, this is an example of what tree model does. Tree model, you can think of a tree model as a kernel-based model. Or you can, you know, kernel-based machines, any kernel-based modeling, what it does, it basically builds a kernel, you give a point, and the kernel machine will try to find the neighbors, and then the weights uh, which will be used for the neighbors will be defined by the kernel, and then you average it, and that becomes your prediction. So this is kernel defined by tree model, kernel defined by a random forest model. And what happens in high dimensional spaces, so why do we need something more flexible than these kernel machines in high dimensional spaces? You have what is called uh, concentration of measure. And you have concentration of measure as your dimensionality goes up. Here's a very simple experiment uh, that demonstrates the concentration of measure. What I did, I took the uh, two dimensional image of a uh, thousand dimensional uniform sample inside the bowl. So I take a thousand dimensional bowl and I generate samples inside this thousand dimensional bowl uniformly. So if you basically look at this thousand dimensional bowl, you'll see uniformly filled uh, samples inside this bowl. And then what I do, I take this thousand dimensional bowl and samples inside of it and I project it to two dimensions. And so what you see is the projection in two dimensions. And you see what happens to the uniform sample in two dimensions? You basically have a lot of the concentration around the center. Just because most of the volume of this thousand dimensional file is uh, around the equator, okay? And most of the, if it's uniform sample, most of the samples will concentrate around the equators. And this is uh, Martian distribution. So if I project it to one dimensional space and I plot the density of, um, of the samples, so it happens in 400 dimensional space. So that's basically concentration of measures as a function of dimensionality. But that's what happens in 100 dimensions, that's what happens in 400 dimensions. So if the dimensionality goes up, you basically will see high and high, high, high concentration around the zero. Okay? So if you use any kernel-based technique, what will happen? If I give you a new point here and I'll ask you to predict 
the, you know, this is new X and I ask you to predict new Y for this point, the kernel-based method will try to find neighbors and weight those neighbors to do the prediction. And in high dimensional space, it's very likely that your new X is going to be very long. It's not going to have any neighbors. So your prediction will fail in high dimensions. Okay? So that's, that's basically the problem in high dimensions that is not addressed by traditional stats models. Um, here's a, some theoretical justification for why deep learning works. Um, Kalmogorov and Arnold, they showed this result in 1956. Uh, they showed that any uh, smooth function, any function, nonlinear, defined on a unit um, square, can be represented as a superposition of univariate functions. And it's not approximate results, it's actually exact results. So you can show that it exactly any, any nonlinear function can be represented as a superposition of univariate functions. The way they proved the result, they used uh, subtime of fractal theory, so they took a space and basically had this infinite dimension. So it's not a proof that leads to any algorithm, unfortunately. So it's not like you can build uh, this, uh, this combination of univariate functions, but at least it's a theoretical result that gives you hope that any function, any complex function can be represented as a composition of univariate functions. And that's exactly what deep learning is, right? So that's the definition of deep learning. You have some input space, uh, input x, and you apply some function f to it, and fl minus 1 up to fl1. And each of those functions is just you take your input, you take a fine transformation to this input, so this is linear plus scalar, and then you apply nonlinearity to it. And if you do it many times, okay, if you do it many times, so that's what the program does, it applies it many times, you basically have a very flexible pattern matching machine. Um, and again, those of you who are trained in statistics, you probably recognize this part of the model. So this, this is linear model, right? It's just the linear model of the inputs. And you apply nonlinearity to linear model, you get what? Generalized linear model. It's just a generalized linear model. So what deep learning is, it's a sequence of generalized linear models applied one after another. So again, from, from, from statistical perspective, it's just, uh, it's just a hierarchical generalized linear model. There's nothing, nothing special about that. Okay. Yeah, so statisticians basically, if you, if you take a traditional stats model, it will focus on this, right? Take some in reality and apply it to, to a fine transformation of your inputs. Deep learning basically takes it and say, we're going to do it many times. This is again some silly example of uh, why deep learning works uh, quite well. Um, this is a one layer deep learning model with ReLU nonlinearity, so that's our sigma function. ReLU is a very simple function, ReLU of z is just max of 0 and z. And what ReLU does, it basically splits you into space with hyperplanes. Okay? And uh, so this is a simple ReLU model with uh, three neurons, and it splits your input space into seven regions. And if you start stacking those ReLU layers one after another, you basically will have this exponential growth of the number of subregions uh, which divide the input subspace. So with deep learning, another geometric interpretation of deep learning, you can think of it, you take those hyperplanes, you divide your input space, then you take another set of hyperplanes and you divide those subspaces, and you keep doing that. And as you add your layers, your number of subspaces will grow exponentially. Okay? This will so that's the that's geometric, uh, geometric interpretation. Here's again, see the example of uh, where I can turn deep learning model, a very simple uh, neural network, actually, a two-layer neural network with a tree-based model. So we try to discriminate greens from reds. And uh, so if you have some simple pattern and you can discriminate greens from reds quite easily, this is a tree model and this is a deep uh, neural network. So, you know, tree model does quite well on the simple pattern. Then you have a little bit more sophisticated pattern where you have, you know, green dots inside the red circle. Again, tree model does that quite well. It basically plots these dividers that goes along the axis. And deep learning does that quite well as well. But the moment you have a little bit more sophisticated part of the spiral pattern, right? So you have two spirals, one going after another, and uh, you try to build a tree model that fits into that. And of course, it fails miserably. It tries to divide the space into those subregions that and line go parallel to the axis. So it doesn't doesn't give you any good result. But you know, neural network with somewhat similar complexity, you know, the same depth, will actually you know will fit this pattern quite. 
So it, it allows you to fit those uh, spiral, spiral patterns. Here are a couple of Kalmogorov uh, Arnold examples, maybe. Uh, actually, I do have some time. So here, so here a little example of uh, how Kalmogorov Arnold works. Um, you have a nonlinear function of two variables, x1 times x2. And you can represent that, you remember what Kalmogorov Farnold said, it's basically a fine transformation point followed by nonlinearity, right? So you have a fine transformation followed by nonlinearity, another affine transformation followed by nonlinearity. Okay? So in, in statistics, you call interaction of x1 and x2, right? So deep learning will represent interaction of x1 and x2 using this representation. Okay? This is another nonlinear function, max of x1 and x2 is another a fine transformation followed by absolute value nonlinearity, a fine transformation followed by nonlinearity, absolute value. Um, what's, the, what's the advantage of that over just, just x1 times x2? Uh, because uh, x1 times x2, you basically have to hand crop it. You have to, if you, if you try to build the linear model, and you have to design those features, right? You can do that. If you know exactly what interaction between the terms, you can do that. But the idea of deep learning is that you basically build very complex deep learning model that tries to capture all possible <coughs> interactions. So, and then you can sparse it out. You can, you can zero out a lot of neurons. So the idea is that you build very complex thing and then sparse it out, okay? Rather than trying to handcraft all possible combinations of interaction. But if you know them up front, if, if, you, if you build this not to automatically identify them, yes, you can do it by hand. Uh, but if you're talking about million dimensional spaces, doing things by hand, and people spend a lot of years doing things by hand, so a lot of the Bayesian modeling have been used actually, you know, graphical models we used for image analysis before deep learning was around. And the idea was, yeah, we somehow will try to look, but you know, deep learning looks, looks much better. Uh, we can learn computer programs, right? So you have x1 and x2 binary variables, you can find them. And operating, you can learn it as a fine transformation followed by nonlinearity, i is the uh, function is returns zero if the statement is false and one of the statement inside the true. So you can think of i as just nonlinear function. Uh, we can use we can learn or operator. We can do you know all uh, not operator. So we can learn we can learn logical functions using the same concept: a fine transformation followed by nonlinearity. So you can think of taking complex computer program and splitting them into logical statements, and you can learn those logical statements. And if you want to have nested statements, like in your program you'll have nested statements, that will correspond to basically layers of neural network. So you have one logical statement followed by another logical statement, it's gonna be layer after layer. Okay, so that's, that's basically bottom line. Any function can be represented using deep learning. Uh, two layer uh, can represent any Boolean function, uh, and any convex polygon can be represented using two layer network. So you remember those hyperplanes, so you can basically build the hyperplanes and just need two layers to have enough hyperplanes to represent any convex polygon. You actually can show that three layers is enough to build any non-convex polygon with discontinuities. So just adding another layer allows you to build much more complex geometries. And Kalmogorov Arnold basically says that affine transformation plus single nonlinear function approximates any smooth function with any accuracy. So this is an example of uh, use of deep learning uh, projects inside Google. They published it. Uh, there is actually an updated version of it that goes up to 2016. And that's actually how I first uh, learned about deep learning. I had a lunch with a person from Google somewhere around 2012. And he complained about, oh, everybody has to do deep learning now. I don't, you know, I don't know what it is. I don't like it. But you know, we were told that everybody has to try it now. And that was Google's policy then. And apparently it worked. So you can see the number of projects growing exponentially inside Google. Uh, and uh, Google is trying basically, you know, anytime you dictate something in your Google phone, and you take a picture, it will go through a different model nowadays. So they do it at huge scales and do it quite successfully. So this is another uh, silly metric of popularity of those models. Uh, the right, this is Google Trends, you're familiar with Google Trends, you basically type a term and it shows you the popularity of this term. Uh, so this is the regression analysis is the red line and deep learning is the blue line and you see what happens at around uh, You know March of uh, 2016 a couple of years ago. It basically bypassed you see this uh, cyclic pattern in linear regression 
you guys have a good explanation for secret patterns in linear regression searches? When the yeah. academic finals are coming up. Yes, yeah, twice a year, students realize that they need to take an exam. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> modern version of yeah, so you actually that's it's very good thing. Yeah, modern version of you know preparing for exams is don't go into Google and search for the terms that you think you will be asked about in your exam, and try and learn from you know from Google results about that. Yeah, nobody reads books by the way anymore. That I realize people people don't like books. Everybody goes to Google and, and just searches on Google whatever they want to learn. Yeah. Um, Ah, by the way, by the way, you start seeing cyclic patterns in deep learning. <laughs> you start seeing cyclic patterns in the deep learning searches. You know why? Same reason. Yeah, because it's been you know you know schools started offering deep learning courses now. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm teaching deep learning courses at the George Mason now. So you you'll see the same. The end of each semester, students try to figure out. Okay, well, the training and validation um, is basically you train deep learning model as you would train any other machine learning model. You have to formulate a loss function, and your loss function will depend on whether you solve classification or regression problem, right? And you try to minimize the weights and bias uh, in terms of your deep learning model. Um, so, as, as basically, you know, in, in, in the regression case, you try to minimize the misfeed, the difference between the predicted values and the actual observed errors. So there's nothing uh, nothing special about it. Uh, but what's special actually about uh, about this function, um, so, so we have to solve this minimization problem somehow, right? Um, uh, this is a very complex function. So it's a superposition of those affine plus nonlinear, and you have, you know, dozens of those layers, and each layer will have, you know, dozens of neurons. So it's, so it's a quite complex function. And now we have to, it's, of course it's nonlinear, function is nonlinear. It's uh, more, moreover, it's non-convex, okay? Uh, and we have to optimize this nonlinear, non-convex function somehow. And uh, one of the uh, breakthroughs, breakthroughs in deep learning was the realization that simple stochastic gradient descent methods actually work quite well. So gradient descent is the method is on stochastic gradient descent is a stochastic version which comes from Robbins Monroe. This is 50s. Okay, this is technology from 50s. Nothing new about that. At some point, people realized it works quite well to minimize those functions. And that actually happened, uh, whatever, in late 90s when people realized that. So it's, it's, it's quite a new discovery. And once people discover it, uh, stochastic gradient is, 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 is uh, stochastic gradient descent can be paralyzed. So now you can paralyze those things. You can, you can compute those, those derivatives of this function in parallel. And uh, so you can do whatever, map reduce, you can distribute it, right? And you can do it on distributed machines. Uh, you can use it, uh, you can do it on GPUs, also parallelize it using GPUs. So that's what basically allowed to build uh, very large deep learning models and train them quickly, uh, stochastic gradient descent. And, and then uh, accelerated version of it is called Nestor of Acceleration, uh, which was developed in, uh, in the early 80s. So Nestor developed this basically uh, acceleration technique for gradient descent. And it was lying on the shelf since then. For 20 years, nobody cared about it. And again, deep learning people picked it up, realized it works quite well for those functions. And this drop acceleration is, is kind of a default thing now when you try to optimize those functions. Okay? So, so theory of it and why it works and, and um, uh, optimization techniques that go into that are not new. So people knew that a long time ago. There is not much new of math is happening here. But just combining those things together, combining it with uh, fast uh, uh, computing architectures, that's what'll, and, and of course, growth of the data sets, right? So why, why it's growing so fast in Google and Facebook is because they have growing data sets. Uh, they have data sets that cannot be processed with more traditional models. And we can process in deep learning, and we can do it efficiently in parallel. So that's all kind of came together. Uh, but propagation is technique used to find derivative. That's a chain rule applied uh, to the deep learning model. There is nothing fancy about it. It's basically bottom line. We can help with derivatives rather quickly and cheaply. Okay? And we can do it in parallel as well. Uh, there's a whole bunch of um, startups now that try to develop hardware uh, for deep learning. Uh, NVIDIA was the provider of the hardware for many years. It was a gaming, uh, gaming chip that can do those matrix vector multiplications quite fast. If you look at deep learning, the, the main operation is this matrix vector multiplication, calculating those affine transformations. So GPUs can do it very, very fast. 
and uh, GPUs have been using for, for a while, and now, you know, Google is trying to compete. They have what is called uh, Tensor Processing Unit to calculate this, uh, those things. And uh, anyhow, yeah, there's there's whole big market of, of chips for uh, for processing deep learning models. Um, and and this, this is, again, one silly example. It's basically linear regression implemented using uh, uh, deep learning framework. So, so something that, you know, you basically specify your prediction rule, right? You say, it's uh, X uh, transpose beta uh, plus uh, uh, alpha, which is the uh, bias or constant coefficient. And then you specify your negative log likelihood if you're in statistics or loss function, you, you, if you're in machine learning, it's basically prediction uh, minus the true value squared and then summed up. Um, and then you basically say uh, loss the backward. So this function, this is ultimate differentiation. So that's another one of the innovations uh, of the deep learning libraries. Uh, what will happen here, this backward function will differentiate this loss function. So I don't have to go and hand uh, type what is the derivative is. And I can have very complex function here. I can have you know very, very sophisticated function here, but this backward will still calculate the derivative that happens automatically. So that's the beauty of it. And then optimize the step basically just one step on the gradient descent uh, towards the minimum. Okay. Uh, so those are a few examples on image analysis and so machines are becoming actually better for some for some of the tasks. Um, um, you know, a lot of the applications in, in medicine, if you're thinking of image analysis, so you saw image analysis for vehicles last time, but there's a whole bunch of applications for analyzing X-ray images and uh, all type of images that uh, happen to be collected in, in medicine. Uh, AlphaGo is a good example. Uh, it's basically reinforcement learning, and Alex Bine will become a TNT, so you will see a whole talk on the reinforcement learning. Uh, yeah, so I will, I will not go into, into that. So what's, what's wrong with deep learning approaches? Uh, we can point estimates from those, so you just get a number. Um, there is no good model selection mechanisms, and there is no good regularization mechanisms. And uh, since there's a lot of... Um, Bayesian DNA in this um, in this room, you, you guys do appreciate, you know, that point estimates are not good estimates, that you need some uncertainty. There's a whole bunch of reasons about, you know, why we do, do we need those those uncertainty estimates to build into the learning models. Um, so so quick introduction, what is what is the base? Um, right, uh, we have um, uh, so our goal is to incorporate uh, so theta is our weights and bias to the deep learning model, right? Um, we just call it generically theta, and we have some data set X. Um, if it's a supervised problem, then you're going to have input output pairs observed. And uh, we want to understand the uncertainty about the weights and bias of the, of the deep learning model. Uh, so we're going to use the Bayes rule to calculate the posterior of the weights, uh, uh, which is the product of the likelihood. And again, likelihood in, 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 the, in, the, in the case of regression, likelihood is just going to be difference between predicted uh, and observed uh, times the prior uh, for P. And uh, posterior basically will have all the information that you can extract from the data set given the prior. <coughs> um, so there are two steps in this Bayesian approach, right? Uh, we have a training data set D. And we would like to build a predictive model, so we'd like to find distribution of y given the input x uh, parameters and uh, data training data set. Uh, we define the prior, we find the posterior, which is the training step by applying the Bayes rule, and then we predict uh, using the total probability rule. Right? So again, this is a standard Bayesian predictive model. There's nothing, nothing different, uh, and whether this likelihood is defined by linear model or by deep learning model. Uh, the, the overall math of it stays the same. So you can think of a base predict basically averages over all of the models parametrized by theta. And uh, here you basically have a posterior with theta, right? So so you can you can think of it as an ensemble model, <coughs> an ensemble model, and the weights are calculated by the posterior which is calculated based on the training data set. So it prevents you from, uh, from overfitting, for example, one thing. It allows you to quantify uncertainty in your prediction because your prediction is going to be distribution rather than point estimate. Okay, so what's wrong with this approach? If you ever try to do those uh, patient uh, predictive models, uh, those two things are intractable. 
in, in the squares, right? So calculating the normalizing constant and the calculating total probability requires integration. And integration usually has to deal with uh, things that uh, are not tractable, so product of those two densities is not going to be uh, analytically calculatable. And uh, you cannot use uh, your whatever favorite numerical uh, integration scheme just because those things are super high dimensions. So if you think of you know using whatever your favorite trapezoid rule to integrate those things. Those, those are more. And actually, those things you know trapezoid rule don't even work for simple models, right? So Bayesians try those. It's like 80s type of thing. So people in the 80s tried to use uh, some quadrature rules to calculate those integrals. Even for simple models, they realized it fails quite quickly. And for deep learning models, this is out of the question. Okay, so we cannot we cannot calculate those integrals. Okay, so this uh, this is probabilistic interpretation uh, of the of the Bayesian approach. Uh, again, you basically formulate your likelihood uh, negative log likelihood is what is called loss function in uh, in machine learning, and negative log likelihood is the loss function. Uh, so let's uh, let's look at the uh, approaches that people use right now. So one of the approaches is what is called the variational inference. Okay, so you have this intractable integral you cannot calculate. Uh, uh, those things. So the trick you do is that you say, okay, I don't want to calculate the actual posterior distribution of my parameter theta. I'm going to approximate my posterior distribution. I'm going to approximate it by some other distribution. We'll call it Q. Okay, so this is Q. And this is uh, phi is the parameter of this approximation. So I parameterize the distribution Q by phi. And now I, instead of uh, finding the original posterior, I want to find this phi. Okay. And the way I'm going to find the best Q that approximates my original distribution is by looking at uh, KL divergence, the divergence uh, which is one of the measures. There, there, there are several ways to get the distances between distributions. KL divergence is one of the ways to measure distances between distributions. Uh, I'm going to look at this. And uh, okay, so to calculate KL divergence, unfortunately, on the right hand side, I have the posterior term. Which is exactly what I'm trying to avoid. I'm trying to avoid to calculate the posterior of my data given the data, and it shows up in the yield divergence on the right hand side. So I have to get rid of it somehow, and that's what variation inference does. Uh, it uses uh, this identity that uh, KL divergence plus what is called elbow, we'll look in a second what is elbow, is the total probability. Okay, and this is probability over data set D. And this one is constant, this does not depend on the weight, okay? Because we integrate out the weights here. So this one is constant. So which means that uh, minimizing this one, minimizing the divergence, is the same as maximizing this, what is called elbow. And always the upper bound uh, on the total uh, probability. The bottom line is, uh, if, if you don't follow the methods, it's fine. The bottom line is that we can convert the problem of calculating posterior and calculating those intractable integrals to the, to the optimization problem. So again, this is non-convex function, but we, we have some ways to solve this non-convex function. And this is function that's quite easier to, it's, it's yeah, anyhow, so it's an optimization problem. Uh, this is problem we know how to solve, um, and we can do it in a tractable fashion. So we, you know, we can do it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so down a bit. So what's, what's the virtue of the Q functions here? Why, why are you using those? So Q is a function that is uh, approximation to the posterior distribution. Okay. So the virtue of the Q function is that it's much simpler distribution. And usually, um, it's going to be mean field inference. So it's going to be product of univariate normals, for example. So what essentially do you approximate your very complex posterior with the product of univariate normals? So it's a huge assumption. It's a huge assumption. But if you're okay to make this assumption, if you're okay to live with it, and if you think that's usable for your model, uh, you can convert problem of calculate posterior to the optimization problem. Yeah, to calculate this one, you basically have to have a lot of assumption about how Q looks like. I, I kind of skip in those details, but but that's yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, so that's a trade-off. You can have a tractable solution, but you have to have some assumptions about your approximation. And that's bread and butter for most of the Bayesian approaches uh, nowadays, it's variational inference. And um, as you can see, there's a lot of disadvantages just because you have to make a lot of the assumptions. Uh, that's basically, the, this, this is some technicality that we probably can skip. Let's see. Uh, I mean, 
I'm just saying that we know how to how to optimize this function, but there's a lot of technicality how we optimize this function because we have to calculate gradients of it, and calculating gradients is not that straightforward. So there's reparameterization tricks, uh, but I think for the sake of keeping, yeah, the, the, you say it's you have relatively easy ways to do that. Are you used? Is that a true statement for the mean field approximation that you're talking about, mm -hmm. or is it a broader statement that's true for other kinds of? No, it's a uh, it's very specific set of yeah like. Uh, so what people do, they say, oh, we're going to approximate in the mean field, right? So we're going to take it as private mean or normals. And then we can show how we can uh, optimize this function. Uh, but the moment you're away from this very simple set of the, not sure. yeah, that's not, not sure. yeah, it's not general statement. It's, it's a statement for a very narrow set of, uh, set of distributions. So that's, that's a very good, yeah, that's a very good comment. Okay. Um, so I will, I will skip the details how we, uh, uh, how we uh, solve those problems. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about dropouts. Uh, so dropouts is another way to bring Bayesian into uh, deep learning. So we talked about variational inference. Dropout is another way to do it. Uh, dropout is a very simple technique. So you generate noise. So your D is noise, and you generate, for example, normal noise with mean one and some variance uh, sigma squared. And then you take the weight of your ELF layer of your neural network model, and you perturb them by that noise. So what you do, just introduce noise into the weights of your, uh, of your model, and then you pre do prediction using the noisy version of the weights. And you do it layer after layer. So to implement your pilot, you don't really need to modify much your code. So what you do with each layer, you basically multiply your weights uh, by some noise and you do prediction. And so you, you basically introduce noise into the parameters. You introduce the normal noise. And you actually can, can demonstrate that by doing this technique is equivalent to defining this type of prior on your weights. So the prior on the weights is one over absolute value of theta. So each weight is each each weight of your function gonna have this prior. So doing this normal dropout is equivalent to defining such a prior on your weights. This is the this is the graphical representation of this prior. Okay. So there is there is duality between uh, specific prior and uh, type of dropout that you do. Um, here's another example of dropout called binomial dropout. So instead of introducing normal weights, uh, noise. We introduce uh, binomial. So we just draw zeros and ones. This is uh, this is Bernoulli distribution with parameter p. So we, it's a coin flip. Okay. And then what I do, I multiply my weights by those coin flips. So what I do, I basically remove randomly weights from the model. So I kind of sparse it out in a random fashion. Seems quite stupid if you if you just stare at it, right? So it, I have a model. I have a bunch of weights, and then I flip coins, bunch of coins. And then it's, you know, I basically take a weight, I flip a coin, coin goes head, like, oh, throw out, goes tail, stay, uh, throw out. So I basically do that to each of the weights of the model. Quite, quite a strange procedure, right? Uh, but you actually can show it, it was a paper published in 2012, that uh, doing this is equivalent to specifying G prior on your model weights. Uh, G prior is a normal prior uh, with uh, zero mean in covariance proportional to the Fisher information matrix. And G-prime was a big thing in, uh, in Bayesian predictive models, and still is, actually. It's, you know, something that Bayesians understand quite well. Um, so, so, again, this is some very nice uh, interpretation that goes back to traditional Bayesian approaches. Um, it's, it's, it's a G-prime. And uh, dropouts is another quite, uh, quite popular technique to bring uncertainty into the models. So you can think of it basically running multiple dropout experiments. And at the end, you have ensemble of predictions. And you can think of this ensemble of the predictions as the samples from the pos predictive posterior distribution. So you, you can sample predictive posterior distribution by doing dropout. And people, people do it quite, uh, quite often. Uh, the main beauty of dropout is that it doesn't require much code changes. So you just need to introduce this line of code that flip coins and zero out the weights according to the coin flips. Yes. So just to clarify, you're talking about applying dropout during both the training and the prediction. Uh, so I think it's, we're talking about prediction. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so during training, there's a trick that you have to use. Yeah. So we're not talking about training step, obviously. But 
there's one line change in the training step as well. So both training and prediction basically require very minimal changes to the model uh, to drop out for the model, uh, to be implemented. Is there a justification to this? It seems, I mean, I get that the neural net has been trained and it's going to give you essentially point estimates for fixed input. You'd like an ensemble of outputs. So you're going to get there by telling your model, which has already been trained to, you know, according to some probability distribution, ignore some, you know, certain neurons to get this ensemble of predictions. Yeah. Um, Actually, during training, what, what the question, so we have to do something during training as well. So during training, we also zero them out, but then we reweight the remaining of the weights to make sure that, the, you know, the overall sum is the same. So when we train the model, we have to be aware that during the prediction, we're going to use dropout. Yeah, that, that makes more sense. Yeah. So now you're yeah. 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 training to accommodate the dropout mm -hmm. during the test. Yes. Yes. What's the comparison between the dropout methodology and a Bayesian neural network, where instead of trying to learn weights, you're trying to learn a probability distribution on each? It's computationally easy to implement. So there is not there is no MCMC happening here. There's it's it's very it's like one line of code during training, one line of code during the prediction, and you're done. Uh, so variational inference allow ask you to make a lot of assumptions about. Um, you can use MCMC, by the way. Uh, so Markov chain Monte Carlo is traditional Bayesian approach to calculate posteriors uh, for those predictive models. Uh, people tried it in the 90s, and the claim is that MCMC fails. So in high dimensional space, and, and we know in high dimensional spaces, MCMC Markov chain Monte Carlo does not work very well, and people tried it. And I think at this point, it's like abundant branch of, of, of approaches. But I, I think it might be worth trying to actually go back. And if, if, if I personally had more time, I, I would do that. I would go in and, and actually <laughs> try those MCMC and, and see why exactly it happens. And if maybe there is, yeah. Um, question for you about this. Have you thought about this in the context? I mean, one way to look at these things is it's basically a coding model, right? So I'm, I'm just in, introducing a compression and a coding scheme, mm -hmm. right? So when you think about it in that sense, if I'm dra dropping out these weights periodically and I'm, I'm learning the code at the same time that I'm implying the decode, isn't that just a different way of imagine, imagining redundant coding? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people, uh, one of the actually, People realize that you can use it for uncertainty quantification later. First application of dropout right. was uh, it's a paper published in 2014, I think. Right. And the application of dropout was to regularize the model. Regularize means uh, remove un, uh, redundant nodes right. or redundant connections. Yeah. So that's, that's exactly was how how the dropout came out. Uh, you basically and that's what we talked about earlier. You build this very complex model and then you can apply dropout and you can zero out a lot of the so you can make it uh, more parsimonious as statisticians would say of a model, okay? But yeah, that's 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 exactly the motivation for the original dropout. Uh, but then people realize you can do uncertainty quantification, so it's kind of a byproduct of what what you are saying. Yeah. Um, so and actually, so I, I I'm, I'm done here with with you know current Bayesian approach. I want I want to show a little bit how we use uh, those approaches in, in in our work. Just you know few few examples of uh, of those things. So here's here's one example is uh, uh, we are trying to uh, optimize a simulator. It's a simulation based optimization. We have a complex simulator phi, and we have observations of the true process wise. Okay, so we observe the true process. In our case, it's traffic flows or passenger flows on the network. So we observe the passenger flows and we have simulated that predict those passenger flows, our simulator parameterized by phi. And the relationship between the observed and the simulated, uh, we have uh, epsilon, which is inaccuracy of the simulator, because our simulator is an approximation of the true process, so that's inaccuracy of the simulator, and E is the measurement noise. So if you take simulator, adjust for its inaccuracy, adjust for the, uh, for the observation noise, you get the true observations Y, okay? And our goal is to uh, calibrate the simulator, meaning that we want to find the parameters uh, theta so that the difference between simulated and observed values is as small as possible. So we're trying to fit simulator into data set. Again, as, as, as you fit statistical model in the data set, in case of our uh, work, uh, this is not some linear model, generalized linear model, it's actually a complex simulator. The problem with that 
you know, we don't have derivatives, of course, of this simulator. We cannot differentiate this function phi. Uh, the simulator is stochastic. Each simulation takes a few hours on the task desktop. Um, and theta is very high dimensional, we're talking about. And again, our high dimensional is not the same as Google high dimensional. So our high dimensional is a couple hundred dimensions. Uh, but even, even when you talk about hundred dimensions, so thinking about, uh, think about solving global optimization problem with the hundred dimensional space. So this is the problem that we're facing. Um, so we use Bayesian approach to solve this problem. Uh, we want to build a surrogate F that approximates the simulator. Okay. And uh, we want uh, the surrogate to interpolate our simulator at the given location. So we want to build interpolation. Uh, and we want our simulator to have some uncertainty built in. Uh, so we want to have some predictive uncertainty. We want to say that the value of the simulator, uh, of the surrogate evaluated at some point theta, it follows some distribution uh, conditional on the observed uh, locations to spot. Does, does that make sense? And why do we need uncertainty in our surrogate? Because we want to have sequential design of the experiment. We want to use this uncertainty. It's, it's like an active learning. So when I want to sample, when I want to decide which next point to evaluate my simulator at, I want to know where my surrogate is very uncertain. So I want to have my uncertainty as small as possible. That's how I design the experiment. A sequential sample the input space. And remember, the input space is very high dimensional, and simulator takes a few hours to run. So I want to be very frugal about uh, how many locations I use to evaluate uh, the simulation. So that's that's basically a setup. Uh, our surrogate model, I call it L, sorry. It was F on the previous slide. So this is my surrogate. My surrogate is a Gaussian process. And it's a standard approach in what well, it's, it's what is called Bayesian optimization. If you if you come along this curve, uh, so I use Bayesian optimization. I have some surrogate that uh, follows the Gaussian process, and Gaussian process modeled by the mean function and the covariance function. And uh, this is my rule: how I want to generate next point to evaluate. So I define some utility function, and let's say my utility function is that I want to maximize. So L star is my best. Value so far. Remember, I'm trying to solve an optimization problem. So I have the best value so far, and I try to find a new value so that the difference between my best and the new value is as large as possible. Right? So that's that's my design experiment part. And the way I do it, I do it through basically, it's, uh, we'll probably skip the details, but uh, the Gaussian process allows me to um, play between exploration and exploitation. Uh, in the areas of large uncertainty, that's where I want to explore. If I know that my model is very uncertain in certain regions, I want to go and explore there. But I also, in certain regions, I have very good values, so I want to explore them. And my utility function basically is the balance between exploration and exploitation. And the reason I need uncertainty in my surrogate is that I can do this uh, exploration phase. Uh, and Gaussian process allows me to do that. Okay. So the problem with solving those high dimensional global optimization problems using the surrogates that you have to explore this high dimensional space. This is a little bit of, uh, again, silly examples of how cursive dimensionality works. So if you have just 20 dimensional space and you have a simulator that takes one second to run and you want to have a naive design of experiment, meaning that you want to cover the space by grid and you're gonna have 10 points in each dimension in this grid. Very simple design of experiment, very straightforward. So if you cover the space with that grid, you'll have 10 to the power 20 locations on the grid. And even at one second per simulation, it will take you three trillion years to explore this grid, okay? So we're talking about 10 points per, the, 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 per the, the dimension, very fast simulator, three trillion years to explore the space, and feasible. Even if you want to evaluate the corners, it's to the power 20 corners, it will take you 12 days to evaluate just to the corners, okay? So we have to, we have to do something, uh, something else. And, and the way we solve this problem is, uh, this is the uh, contour plot of the simulation outputs. So this is, we just took two variables out of, you know, 200 dimension spaces. So this is theta one and this is theta two. And those are the values uh, calculated by the simulator. And what you can see here that you, you can see actually some patterns of those values. You can see that there's a lot of change happens in this direction and not much change happens in this direction. Okay. 
So now what we want to do, we want to build a neural network that exploits this pattern in the relationship between my inputs, theta 1 and theta 2, and values of the simulator. And essentially what I want to do, I want my, as you said, I want to compress. I want to build a neural network that compresses my high dimensional space into lower dimensional space while taking care of those patterns in the outputs. So this is my goal here. I want to build a neural network. Uh, the general idea is that um, this is my original theta. So I have compression part of the network. I have decompression part of the network. Idea is that when you combine compression and decompression, your recovery, the signal is going to be as close as possible to theta. So that's, we try to minimize this term. But we also try to minimize this term. This is deviation, so this is compressed version, and this is a surrogate, deep learning surrogate for the predicting y. And we want deep learning surrogate to be as close as possible to the true y. So we don't only want to find low dimensional representation of the input space, we want to find low dimensional representation that captures relationship to the out space, okay? So that's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit weird construct, but, uh, but it works. Uh, so uh, this, this, is, this is our model. So we have input parameters theta, we go through compression stage. So we have reduced dimensionality representation of the theta. And this is our uh, uh, part of the neural network that takes it from the slow dimensional to the outputs. You remember simulator it takes inputs to the outputs, right? So, so that's basically approximation from inputs to the outputs. This is our decompression part of the model. So we take it low dimensional representation and we can decompress it back to the higher dimensions. And now what we do, we build the Gaussian process here in this space. And we do our optimization in this space and we do uncertainty quantification in this space. So we build a surrogate model that just works in the slow dimensional space. Okay. I, again, I'm not going to go show, show results, but it, it beats pretty much any single uh, naive approach that you can imagine. Uh, this compression decompression trick works quite well, and, and we can bring it certain. So we quantify uncertainty on this layer. So what we do essentially, we take this one and we feed it to Gaussian process, and Gaussian process provides uncertainty. So that's, that's actually not a naive way to, or simple way to bring uncertainty into your model. So you can think of deep learning model basically building your features and you know, compressing your space in the solo dimensional space, and then you can slap some probabilistic model at, at the end of it. In our case, it's Gaussian process, but you can take your favorite uh, Bayesian model at the end and just build this Bayesian model on those outputs. So that's how you can go from those high dimensional inputs, and you can still use your favorite Bayesian models that work in low dimensions, and you can ask the neural network to compress you into six uh, low dimensional spaces. Okay? So that's, that's the trick with essentially here. Okay, uh, I think I'm out of time, right? Yes, I'm out of time, so I probably will stop here. Uh, actually, it's, it's a quick example of how this reconstruction works. So I have a 100-dimensional function. So x is 100-dimensional here. I just take an inner product and an absolute value, and I have a univariate function. And if you plot the x0 versus value of x, you basically see some noise. But the deep neural network actually can find this pattern, this V-shaped pattern, absolute value pattern in this relationship, without me telling how this pattern looks like. So it's, it can recover this whole dimensional space uh, in the, in the, okay, so, um, probably we'll stop here. I'll, I'll go to the, I, I have a few examples of, of the work that we're doing, but for the sake of time. So in the summary, uh, many successful applications, uh, deep learning, uh, can improve on traditional REM and Fourier models, and we can compose it with Gaussian process to bring uncertainty, um, into, into our modeling process and, uh, variational base and drop out is, I think, the first steps towards bringing uncertainty into, into those models. Variational base is very slow also, and it's, it has very harsh assumptions. So I'm, I'm myself a not big fan of, of the variational base approach. Um, so I, I think there's still, we are still doing baby steps towards the direction of bringing uncertainty into those models. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, you know, and again, this is a crowd that doesn't need to explain why uncertainty is important. We want to use uncertainty for explainability of the model and for um, Policy making, for example, or in robotics applications, you guys saw last time, one drop us to be aware of how certain the uh, perceptions are. Right. Okay. Well, buddy, thank, thank you very much. And uh, we'd like to have uh, open the floor to some questions. Well, I have one. <clears throat> nice to you. So, uh, you uh, said early on, and with great emphasis, that Kamal Drop and Arnold 
said that basically three layers are enough. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you're using a lot more layers. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the theoretical justification for that? So you know, your number of neurons have to grow exponentially in the shallow networks. Is there a theorem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually, well, there's no general theorems. Okay. Uh, there are a whole bunch of simple examples. So one example was a paper 2016 by Talgarsky. So what he showed is um, you take a function uh, that looks like a zigzag, okay? Like it's just a zigzag function. It's basically a piecewise linear function. If you try to build a shallow network that approximates this function, then the number of neurons in the shallow layer has to be, uh, it's an exponential function of the number of peaks in the zigzag function. And it's, it's actually, it's a very simple math. It's a, like high school math, you can show it. And then it shows if you build it uh, in a deep fashion, it's a linear number of neurons that you need to, and is a function of those zigzags. So there's a whole bunch of examples like that um, that show you why you need uh, this direction versus this direction. But I don't think there is a general theory about it. Uh, but that's, yeah. Isn't there a a trade-off between the number of layers uh, and the smoothness of the nonlinear function? Um, so you need you need more layers to have uh, if you have very not smooth patterns. So if you have a line, right? So think about simple case. If you have a line, if you have a linear pattern then you can just fit the line in it. So it's a neural network with one layer without running the yard, right? If you have a spiral, so the simple examples I showed, right? The spiral actually require you two layers with some non-linearities. So I guess, so intuitive answer to your question is that the more complex pattern, the more non-smooth pattern you have, the more layers you have to introduce into your model. Does that? Uh, yeah, I was, act, I was actually uh, asking something slightly different, which is if you if you fix fix your multivariate function. And what I've been reading, just after being inspired by this <coughs> theorem that you, I had never seen before. Uh, the result seems to be that um, if you Reduce the number of layers, then the then, then the nonlinear functions that you need to apply are increasingly non-smooth. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So that's actually a result. It's also a result from uh, late fifties. Um, yeah, I, I cheated a little bit. So I showed you. I told you it's Kalmagorov Farnold, and then showed you something smooth. But it was actually shown in Kalmagorov Farnold formulation. Those nonlinear activations have to be non-smooth, even if your function f is smooth in terms of approximate. Yes, right. yes. So Kalmogor Cal Farnold is not a very applicable thing. It's just a concept that gives you a warm feeling about the whole idea of building those superpositions. Uh, but it's, yeah, if you try to actually implement Kalmogor Farnold, one thing you have to have non-smooth non activation functions. And those non the way to build those activation functions is basically infinitely dividing the input space. So it's not very uh, practical. You cannot build algorithm around this concept. Uh, but yeah, there is non-smoothness in Talmud or Farnold. Yeah, in the activation functions. What developments have occurred since the 90s that make you think it would be interesting to revisit MCMC as a way to generate exterior? Why don't you try to repeat the question? So the question was, uh, what happened since uh, 90s when MCMC was, uh, was tried for uh, for deep learning. Well, my concern is nobody else have tried it. It's oh, Maybe people try it and never publish it because it really doesn't work. But you basically see this publication in the 90s, people claim it doesn't work, and then it disappeared. So, I, well, what, what, what happened? I, I, I think not much actually methodologically. So we have faster software now. Uh, we have different MCMC flavors. So, you know, in the 90s when we had whatever, Gibbs and uh, uh, Metropolis facing, so now we have this derivative-based MCMC. So, you know, so but it's it's actually not that great of improvements. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I don't have a good feeling why. But it seems like wrong, right? So people tried it in the 90s. Nobody came back to it afterwards. Somebody claimed it doesn't work. And I think what happened actually, people who claim it, uh, Ratan Neil, he's a very authoritative person, right? Uh, from from Toronto. So he has a lot of uh, 
people put a lot of trust in what he says. And I think so much, so it's part of it what happens is like, oh, you know, person who knows what he's talking about said that, so we're just gonna leave it alone. And, uh, but I think it's still worth revisiting and uh, trying it. Yeah, but just just a very strange, you know, I don't have a good explanation why people should. Well, I mean, expanding on what you said, I mean, we sort of threw the towel in on neural networks in the 90s anyways. So yes. what changed to make that work? Yes. Well, same topic, right? Yes. Because lots of compute. And so, yeah. so why why does MCMC take a long time? Well, I gotta compute a lot of stuff, so. Does it, does it make a lot of sense to go back and look at what you can do with today's computing environment? And maybe some new tricks, MCMC tricks, will come out of, uh, you know, if you try to approach neural networks with that, you know. So, uh, yeah, you're right. You know, Presetron was kind of abundant for 30 years just because Vinsky said it doesn't work. And it was it was the same story. It was a person with a lot of authority, person who was very well respected, wrote the book, said this thing doesn't work. And the whole research community abandoned for 30 years. So I'm afraid something something similar might be happening to MCMC. So I don't have a good thing. Yeah. So you have um, this general technique, it looks like, where you use an autoencoder and you get to a smaller dimensional space. So it seems, but I just wonder what kind of analyses that maybe don't work at high dimensions can you do in low dimensions on your low autoencoded space and then blow them up again to get something you can actually use? So I mean, besides our global optimization, besides your global optimization. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we might be thinking of you know building some some Bayesian models that require MCMC, for example. And again, MCMC does not scale well in high dimensions. So we might want to build a set of features. You know, let's say we we can talk about simple Bayesian linear model, hierarchical Bayesian linear model, right? Some complex priors. Uh, but then the question is, uh, because usually when you put your prior on the private of the patient model, usually you have some, like it's a sparsifying prior, right? So you put, you know, uh, uh, Laplace prior so that you can zero out a lot of the parameters of your model. When you move to the feature space, you know, what do those priors really mean? And uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, what? Uh, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, I haven't thought much about it. What, what else you can do? But, uh, but it seems like uh, wherever this computational difficulty working in high dimensions, in our case, it's a global optimization problem. Um, um, yeah, I don't think I have a good answer. Sorry. Okay, so uh, this this concludes the talk. Don't be a little bit. Don't don't go. Uh, don't go too far. Don't don't go away quite yet. There'll be a little presentation afterwards. Stick, stick. Anybody that wants to continue the discussion, please, please stick around. Yeah, we don't have after lunch. To, yeah, and they'll be uh, after lunch. But Dean will be back until about four o'clock for further discussions for those that would like that. Back here, we're just back. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you mean well, well, the only place that matters is Metro. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Okay, well, let's start off there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Vadim, I want to thank you for coming out. Um, I think uh, it sort of speaks to the interest in this that you've exceeded the capacity of our room, at least in terms of the furniture. So the good news is the furniture order comes in this week, so we'll have more chairs next time around. But uh,